Hey. Uh, hello, my name is uh, Tanu Biswas. I'm a childist philosopher of education, uh, currently based at the University of Stavanger and also a member of the Childism Institute. And I'm here with John Wall. I have some uh, questions about childism and uh, I'd like to talk to you, John, about uh, what we you know, the idea of childism, how it's uh, started, uh, perhaps uh, look at some examples uh, and uh, critiques, pitfalls. Uh, and uh, one of the main things I want to have a conversation about is how, um, although childism emerges from childhood studies, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's much broader uh, and the potential and what this theory speaks to uh, is beyond uh, childhood studies. So uh, these are the things I'd like to talk to you uh, about today. Well, hi, thanks, Tanu. Um... I'm John Wall, a professor at Rutgers University and a director of the Childism Institute. Um, and I'm so delighted to talk to you about childism, Tanu, because your work has informed how I think about it in, in lots of different ways. And, um, and I've enjoyed working with you on many projects through the Childism Institute and other venues. So really looking forward to chatting with you. Yeah, likewise. So um, why don't we just uh, start with um, how how childism uh, as a as a theory emerges from childhood studies and and what are the senses that this this term has been used? Uh, yeah, it, well, my my take on that is that childhood studies um, began with a folk began as an attempt to focus on children and their agency, their experiences, the, their lived experiences and differences um, in contrast with uh, adults and, and to do so in a way that um, understood children in and of themselves, which I think is, is, is an amazing, a wonderful, it was a very important step in the late eighties and early nineties when that, when that began. Um, and then uh, critical kinds of perspectives started coming into childhood studies from post-colonialism and, and feminism and other kinds of perspectives that started to question how children are actually marginalized by, the, by societies and marginalized by scholarship. Um, and so childism kind of grows out of those elements in childhood studies, but as I understand it, it's a little bit like the connection between feminism and women's studies or even mm -hmm. gender studies, where you know, childism like feminism is grounded in childhood studies and, and these kind of experiences, but it's an attempt to speak much more broadly than that to any field. So I, you know, I, I, as I understand it, it would be great if political scientists who never thought about children realized, oh, a childish lens is another lens we need to apply besides a Marxist, feminist, you know, decolonialist or, or other kinds of lens. How do you think about that uh, connection to childhood studies? I agree. And I, I think it's, um, it's, it's very, it's pertinent that, um, those who engage with childism, you know, whether or not they come from childhood studies, are are able to see that childism is is not only about lives of children or analyzing uh, childhood, which is very important. And you know, without those kind of projects, childism would not have emerged. But, uh, you know, what happens after that? What do we do with the knowledge uh, that we gain from uh, engaging and taking an interest in children's life worlds, their, uh, uh, you know, their uh, experiences and uh, just understanding what, what is what is marginalization all about uh, you know can we broaden our understanding of that because uh, as you in your work you have mentioned this and uh, Sebastian Barajas has also talked about you know the undoing privilege uh, paper that he's written there is there's this kind of 
triple marginalization uh, with with uh, when it comes to children and childhood, and we see that in theory, we see that in 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 practice as well. So it's like uh, children have been marginalized from discussions on marginalization. Now, one thing is what that does to children's lives and the place of childhood. But what does that do with a society or any project that is trying to understand transformation and you know social justice, uh, intergenerational relationships? So it's it's about expanding that. So uh, I think childism can contribute and uh, to to other projects, uh, which is why, uh, like I said, it, it's pertinent that we don't just see this as a childhood studies uh, project, but rather as emerging uh, from uh, childhood studies and uh, a lens that is much broader in scope and can, can be applied anywhere. Uh, yeah, th this was one of the the origins of the idea of childism uh, was, uh, uh, for me at least, a frustration with uh, childhood studies where I felt that it was a field that used, that had a lot of interest in theory, but the theory it had interest in was borrowed to, to almost entirely from other fields, um, which is perfectly fine. Um, you know, feminist theorists borrow Marxist theory and decolonial theory, and, and there's lots of interchange between different theoretical kinds of lenses or concepts. Mm perspectives or however you want to understand it but but I didn't see childhood studies as a field developing its own theoretical frameworks and, right. and when you borrow your theories from other fields especially when the theorists in those fields really don't think about children at all which they don't uh, you know I mean even even feminist theories have, have not placed children at the center tip historically Special Marxist theorists, decolonial theorists, uh, even anti-racist theorists you know, or disabilities theorists. You know, th there just hasn't been a focus on children in, on the level of theory. So if you keep using theory from perspectives that have never thought about children, you're, you're never going to put children in focus. So that's what I wanted to do when I started thinking about childism was add that intersectional lens to the array of lenses, but in a way that would bring children themselves as children into focus instead of keeping them separated off into their own separate realm, which is what right. I think childhood studies tends to do sometimes. Uh, and uh, the logic, uh, John, that you're using here, let's say, you know, the logic of frustration here is very similar to the logic, uh, uh, you know, and the critiques that have been used uh, uh, for post-colonial theorists and critiques that came from the Global South saying, you're just, uh, you know, you're using Western theories and you're, you're contextualized in the West in order to make a point about the other, you know, and them not being included. And uh, it's it's sort of this self-defeating purpose. Uh, then the kind of argumentations that develop, uh, if you're, like you say, if you borrow theories that have not we're not coming from the context of childhood you're applying them then uh, theoretically too and i think also within a uh, social context there will be limitations uh and you sort of fall back into the same trap which you're trying to yeah. to um get out of and i'm not saying these kind of traps you know don't happen if you are a childist uh, they sure do as well uh, but um we will come to that. But how, how about um, maybe talking a little bit about the two senses of the the term, John? Because uh, childism, uh, you know, as Oha Zehavi has called it, is a double edged sword. The the word can be used in two completely contradictory senses. Would you like to tell us a bit about those two senses of the term childism, and why is it that you chose? to use the term in this transformative uh, sense of it. Absolutely, yes. Um, so th this is an, connected actually to what we were talking about. I, I, I think one thing that scholars have, have been able to do um, in, recent, in recent decades is come up with a good critique of the way that children are 
let's say, marginalized or uh, disempowered in their societies. And I think it's fairly well known that, that there exists what I call adultism. And this is what Elizabeth Young Brule called childism, which I think is very unfortunate to use that word. But for about ever since that the word adultism was actually first coined in 1903, uh, and it's been a common word in the academy, uh, especially in the 1970s, 80s, and 90s, to refer to the problem of the ways in which children are um, disempowered or done, done violence to or discriminated against or suffer from prejudice it, from the adults around them or from the societies around them. It, and it's been used in a normative sense as well. And so I, the concept of childism in the child of studies sense actually was developed before Elizabeth Young Brule wrote her book about childism. And she simply was not aware. Uh, she's a psychoanalyst and had never read a word of childhood studies and, and unfortunately skipped over that entirely. Instead, she came from a much more traditional psychoanalytic perspective that looked at children as, you know, sm small or developing into adults eventually. And so she applied ideas of discrimination from other fields uh, like sexism and homophobia to children. Um, but the problem is that, uh, again, it, it, you could compare it to feminism. You know, it, it, it's, it, it's not enough for feminism just to be a critique of sexism. Um, it wouldn't it wouldn't get very far if, if if the word feminism simply meant the same thing as the word sexism. So for me, it was clear that the word childism had to be distinguished from adultism or the, or the way Young Brule uses the word childism, because it's necessary not just to undo marginalization, right. which we've known about for a long time, but to rethink the norms and structures that underpin that marginalization. Until you start to reconceive social categories and structures and ideas, you're never going to undo the marginalization that, that we're, we're all so familiar with. What is your think, thoughts about the... I'm, the I'm also thinking of um, Chester Pierce's uh, use of the term um, in, the, in the 80s. Uh, uh, he, he coined the term uh, microaggression as well and you know, come, has contributed a lot to critical uh, race studies. Uh, to when he used the word childism, also a bit like Elizabeth uh, Young Brewer, um, in, in this adultism sense of the term. And the uh, the reasoning there was that, you know, he used it to mean like racism, uh, you know. So if you take race to be a negative term, uh, you know, something even derogatory, uh, and then you have racism and that childism, then we say child is a derogatory, you know, negative word, and then you get childism uh, from that. and. I, I tend to um, disagree with, uh, I, I see the point, I totally see the point and uh, it fits uh, within the, uh, his framework. Uh, but I, I, I uh, am skeptical about using or saying that child is a, a you know, derogatory word or there's a negative sense and so let's call it uh, childism because it is about something adult structures uh, you know, it's about adult oppression and marginalization of children. Uh, so we call it adultism. And uh, yeah. yeah, and I think the using the term in this sense, then also, uh, you know, there's this pitfall of then reproducing a kind of adultism um, too, because why should the term child be? A negative word. Why should it be okay to call an adult a child, or you know, use that as an insult, or call someone a baby? Um, so, I'm, and in my work um, in uh, pedagogy and education, I, I emphasize that there's a lot uh, we can learn from children and and childhood, and the barrier is that adults, you know, have to be able to let children and uh, youth teach them something. Uh, yes. Yeah. Transformative uh, uh, word for me. Hmm. I, I agree with you, and I think you put it very well in, in other contexts where you've said that 
you, we don't want to use the name of children to name something which adults do to oppress them. And I can, I very much agree with that. And I think it's also, it's unfortunate because, because there is a deeper problem here, which is that infantilization of people is part of a lot of other social problems. So the infantilized decolonialism sort of in some parts fights against the, infa the, the constructed infantilization of right. non-Westerners and feminism fights against the constructed infantilization of women. Um, even Marxism fights against the constructed infantilization of, of the of poorer people. Right. Um, and racism, of course, you know, it, uh, it has built itself on saying, well, people of certain races are more like children. And, and so all of those have used the, the figure of the child in a negative sense um, to, to oppress. And so a childism has, has this fairly radical dimension, which is not just attempting to demarginalize children themselves, but joining with other critical perspectives to demarginalize the very concept of child childishness or infantilization. Right. Right. And I think that would help a great deal in decolonial feminist and other movements to, to finally unpack these ways that mm -hmm. childhood as a figure is used to oppress lots of different people. Uh, John, uh, let's let's talk a bit about the development of childism, especially in the last uh three years, because uh, I mean, childism um, essentially, I would say, also starts with your work in the early 2000s, uh, even, you know, and your book, uh, Ethics in the Light of uh, Childhood. And then you also have a paper um, on, from Childhood Studies uh, to Childism and, and several other publications. But over the last three years, uh, there's a research program uh, called the Childism Institute, uh, and you're the director uh, at Rutgers. Um, why did you start the Childism Institute? Uh, you know, what, what was behind that? Tell us a bit about this, and uh, then perhaps we can talk about some concrete projects uh, within the Childism um, Institute. Yes, yes. Well, and, and you're the uh, now the associate director of the Childism Institute. <laughs> and you were a, a big inspiration behind creating this program. Um, Thank you. Yeah, I mean, it really, it really did arise out of my again frustration with childhood studies, um, and but also my frustration with my own field of political philosophy. Um, I wanted to find a way to bridge. Uh, these fields so that considerations of childhood were not just kept within childhood studies, but also, you know, political philosophers and, and others, you know, historians, um, people in literature, political scientists, uh, even sociologists could, could could have gained some tools to, to bring this kind of thinking into their own larger work agent. So, yeah, I mean, in 2019, uh, I, I just started thinking I, I would like to find a way to to talk to other people about these ideas and generate a a, a, a critical conversation about childhood study about childism that would allow the concept to develop. I sort of felt like I was in my own head to a large extent, uh, even though there were others like you and 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 Hannah Warming and uh, Erica Berman and others using the concept to some extent or in different using similar kinds of ideas. But I really wanted to, to develop that. I should also mention that actually it, the initial idea came from an idea from Hannah Warming, uh, where right. she attempted to create a kind of a center for, for what she calls child prism research which is a very similar idea to childism research. Uh, is, uh, it's, it's more focused on research and she's a sociologist and wants to develop tools and lenses for, and a pr prism as she calls it, for understanding other uh, aspects of society through the prism of childhood. Mm -hmm. Ch the childism is very similar to that. And um, it's very similar to Erica Berman's child as method idea as well. But I think it's got a little bit more of an activistic edge to it, childism. Um, so I really just wanted to um, start a conversation about it, and 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 I realized that 
uh, creating online conversations was probably the best way to go. And and um, and uh, I, I started by bringing together some people at Rutgers that work in child studies and similar ideas, but then quickly realized that it was important to have to create a kind of advisory board of of people like you and Hannah, Erica, and others to, to broaden the conversation. And then you had the idea of creating a transnational um, childism colloquium, which has turned into the central backbone of, of the Childism Institute. And that's been a wonderful opportunity, sort of three times an academic year, really, to, to have a, an online discussion about childism. Um, in relation to all kinds of different ideas like feminism or politics or democracy or decolonialism. And so, yeah, it's been three years now of really interesting, rich work um, that I think has uh, done what I hoped would happen uh, to, a, to an extent, which is create a conversation around childism and explore the pluses and minuses of it and the possibilities of it. Yeah, no, we have a, a, a paper, a very interesting multi-authored uh, paper, uh, which will be published soon, which is a direct uh, you know, result of one of the transnational childism colloquiums. So childism and philosophy, um, which again does what we wanted to do with the Childism Institute, which is to take this lens and look at it uh, and how it speaks to other fields. So philosophy is one area that childism speaks to. And um, this is something that has grown from the childism uh, colloquium. And uh, the Institute, uh, I mean, we co-edited uh, a special issue, which is out now. Um, and the editorial is titled Childism in the Humanities and uh, Social Sciences, um, which also it is one of the first, um, I would say, uh, you know, places where different works from um, speaking to biblical studies, uh, philosophy, education, decoloniality, and so on, come together in one um, uh, issue, yeah, one yeah. special um, issue. That uh, was a very interesting issue because I didn't really realize the extent to which childism had become a lens in biblical scholarship. Um, and it's actually been the, the foundation of a lot of work there and in a, a couple of edited volumes of work as well as individual work. And it makes sense because when you try to understand the historical and literary dimensions of, of the Bible, which is such an influential text in so many different cultures, hmm. um, it's like, again, feminism, that, that there's children there everywhere throughout it and childhood as a concept there everywhere throughout it. But how that concept um, play, play, plays out and is constructed and can be critically understood and how it is used as a lens to, to well, and sometimes infantilize and, and other times do the opposite, empower people is, is fascinating uh, to me. Yeah. And, and actually, just on a historical note, it was at a conference back in 2003, I think, that I heard somebody talk about um the the gospel of matthew and the this idea of jesus putting a child in the midst of the disciples and saying you have to become like a child to become mm. one of these and i realized actually that's quite common in a lot of religions uh krishna as a child and um childishness in buddhism and and other kinds of ideas and, and i realized yeah you know when you put a child in the middle of something it forces you to think about it very differently. And, yeah. and so that was actually part of the inspiration for this whole idea. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what, about, uh, what about human rights, uh, Jean? Can putting uh, the child in the center <laughs> give us a new uh, view on, on human rights? Because what we talked about is also how childhood studies has, you know, tends to focus a lot, I mean, because that's the field, it focuses on children, also on children's rights, but, um, you know, could thinking about children change our view on human rights and not just uh, children's rights? Yes, and and I wrote an article about this in two thousand and eight, um, and I've continued to do work in this. I actually wrote a whole book about it called uh, "Children's Rights: Today's Global Challenge," and hmm. and 
And my work it, since then in children's voting rights has also been along these lines. And absolutely, I think that, that what happens in childhood studies is that the focus around children's rights tends to be on what rights should children have or what rights do children have or how are children's rights to be understood and how, right. how, how are they implemented or not. But it occurred, but what a childish lens suggests is that actually children's rights are part of a human rights framework. I mean, there's the slogan, you know, children's rights are human rights or women's rights are human rights. But what, what you actually need for children to have rights is to rethink human rights and what do human rights mean or what do rights mean in general. And when you look at the history of conversations around rights, what I discovered is that, um, well, up until about 100 years ago, the, the, the idea was, and this comes from even some of the biggest theorists like Immanuel Kant and John Locke and Jean-Jacques Rousseau, they actually argued that human rights or rights are, ex are only for adults, indeed only certain adults, but they, they explicitly say not children because children, for various reasons, would be damaged by them or are not ready for them or what have you. So the very foundation of this idea was built on an adultism. Hmm. And, um, and but, but what happened in the last hundred years is human rights theorists and thinkers just simply accepted that and, and don't even talk about children anymore. There are entire books written about human rights. One of the most um, used books in the last 20 years around children's rights uh, I won't name it, uh, is about 400 pages long and, it's, and it mentions children's rights exactly once uh, in the entire book. So, so children have simply disappeared completely from mm. talk about human rights. Um, so I, I realized, or I thought anyway, I came to believe that um, what's needed is not just a discussion about children's rights, but a discussion about human rights and why human rights are assumed to be the way they are in, mm. in ways that, you know, automatically and silently and invisibly prevent children from having them. And so that's, that's a great example of how, um, I would say, childism can be applied beyond, uh, you know, contexts that have something to say only about children. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And in, in, in turn, broad in that and this would be the same for decoloniality uh you know feminism marxism i would say um we don't have um a, a time to go into the potential of childism to expand uh you know so the projects of these fields but i think this example uh serves the the purpose quite well to to give us an idea of what that is on on a closing note uh john uh what are your thoughts about um, you know, one of the main conclusions of the, the Childism and Philosophy uh, paper that uh, we co-authored with, uh, you know, seven uh, other uh, philosophers. And now uh, the conclusion was that uh, there isn't one ism, uh, you know, there, there should be child isms. Uh, I, um, I think it's very important to keep that in mind and not reduce it to one ism because even you know feminism is also not just one ism it's important that it it is applied in different uh ways what are your your thoughts about uh, childism being a, a plural uh you know pluralist project well i would like to hear your thoughts about it but my, my initial thought is that it, it childism like any other ism must be thought about intersectionally. And so it's, you can't talk about age as a, as a empowering factor without talking about gender, race, class, coloniality, and, uh, and, and other, other things like that. Because human life is, is complex and diverse and multidimensional. Mm. Um, but what would your thoughts be about that? What, the, the multiple child isms. Um, I think in childhood studies, we talk about multiple childhoods. Yeah. Um, but so it's would, only logical that there should be isms. Uh, yeah, multiple isms, yes. Yeah. I mean, my, my feeling is that in our conversations at the Childism Institute, we have in fact started to, de to develop multiple childisms in the same way that there are multiple feminisms because we right. have disagreements over what exactly does it mean um, 
in the philosophy paper, I think someone like Walter Cohan means something a little bit more like becoming more like children as adults, which could be another version of childism. Um, which is what Jesus was asking. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hallelujah. <laughs> we've we've <laughs> finally <laughs> succeeded. <laughs> Uh, no, I think I think just as a as a uh, closing uh, thought, John, I think it's um, uh, uh, across these contexts is I think a recognition that um, adultism is a, a problem. Uh, you know, it is uh, deeply unfair, and um, uh, uh, we haven't looked at that uh, enough. Uh, and uh, you know, even if this trend is is taken into multiple projects like whether it's feminism decoloniality um i think they would start developing a childism uh just by recognizing how adult centered uh you know our our world views and even views of justice uh, uh, are um, yeah for, for me yeah. The, the key really is to think about how to deconstruct adultism and then reconstruct with children and with adults and with many different people, the, 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 the assumptions, the norms, the biases, the, the structures that we all live amongst. And hmm. for it to be an, imagin an imaginative exercise of social creativity and, and the expansion of the social world. So that's the key for me is this reconstructive element. Thank you so much, uh, John. It's been it's wonderful talking to you about this as usual. <laughs> A pleasure to talk to you too, as usual. Thank you very much. Thank you.